You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not uh, as simple as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened up so many more doors. The show is called The The Deal. Deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Happy 4th of July. It is a day of remembrance that, you know, we're free to, I don't know, do stuff, watch TV. (laughs) I don't know. Today we celebrate not having a king anymore. Instead, we just have 500 other little kings that tell us what we can do and can't do and say and think and whatnot. But we're free. We're free as a bird. Happy freedom. So I tried to think of something super cheesy today. I've been making fun of it the entire off season. Like, what could I do that's like 4th of July, free, freedom, freedom to win Super Bowls. Like, it's got to be some kind of a stupid, lame thing that I can come up with. And I kind of struggled with it. But the one thing I could think of, which doesn't necessarily need to be the 4th of July, which is why I wish I could think of something created for the 4th of July and save this for tomorrow, but I can't. Unless something pops into my head in the next 8 seconds before I tell you what we're talking about today. 4th, and I thought about 4th, but it's like, you can talk about the 4th, but then tomorrow's the 5th, and it's just, it's not relevant to the holiday. Fireworks? Explosions. Who's going to explode onto the scene? You know, something like that, maybe? I don't know, could do that. I feel like we already did that, though. Anyways, time's up. Um, it's so stupid. It's been a really hot summer. Lots of, like, 90-degree days that we're not used to in Wisconsin. Even, I think, a couple times got into the hundreds, which is, uh, you know, maybe we get, like, one of those a year. We've already had a couple, I think. I don't know. It's been hot. And so in the spirit of hotness, I figured today we could talk about some hot takes. Huh? Hot takes, hot days, hot... Sh- I don't know. This is what we've... This is what it's become. I don't know what to tell you. I've given in. I've given in. I've given up, man. I tried to fight it. I tried to stay on course and be like, nope, I'm not going down that path of cliche titles and everything. Oof. And I just had the thought of a title that I'm probably going to use that's so stupid. But I think I'm going to use it. Hopefully I forget between now and then and come up with something better. That is like my least favorite part of this whole process is coming up with titles for the shows. I'm already done. I'm exhausted. I want to be done. I want to go get some coffee. I need to go to the bathroom. I want to get my day started. And it's like, wait, you got to come up with a title. It's like, I don't know. It's like, what did you talk about? I don't remember. I I literally don't remember. So then I got to go back through my notes, which most of which I've already deleted because I'm a psychopath like that. I'm that guy that has to close tabs constantly because it's like, why are you here? Even if I probably need you, I just want you gone. So as I'm looking at my notes when I'm done, boom, deleted. And then it's like, why did you do that? Now we don't know what we talked about. So anyways, um, oh yeah, hot takes. So I, I had to think about this a little bit and say, I mean, th- th- this could get real stupid in which we just kind of go down the line and we're like, all right, hot takes. Aaron Rodgers wins MVP. Aaron Jones w- wins MVP. Packers win the Super Bowl. Packers go undefeated. Um, Alan Lazard wins MVP. <laughs> <laughs> like just what is the dumbest possible thing you could think of and then just say it you know Lazard 2,000 yards Aaron Jones 25 touchdowns A.J. Dillon 30 touchdowns 3,000 yards and I, I, I don't want to go down that road so it's tough because hot takes are not things that you necessarily expect I mean they can be it could be something that you expect that most people don't but I can't go through the team and expect a bunch of crazy stuff so it's kind of a balancing act, and some might lean a little bit more into the unrealistic than others, but I'm trying to look at it and say, at the very least, try to get to the point where I could say, there's there's a 50% possibility, and then try to back it up and be able to argue, you know, make a case for it. And that's that's the primary thing. Can you actually make a 
a legitimate argument for it. Might be a stretch. Probably not going to get most people to sign on and it actually happening, but can you defend it, right? So that's the general criteria that I'm going through. And we're just going to kind of rock. I, I'm thinking this is going to take maybe multiple days, but I don't really know. And I'm not saying this is all we're going to do for the next four days. I'm, I'm just saying I want to go through as many as I can, pick a player and, and come up with a hot take. And by the way, they can be negative. I, I feel the desire to make it positive because why just dwell on things? But again, it's 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 something that I think is realistic that most people don't think is going to happen. So negative is a possibility. So this is the plan. We'll see how it goes. I've got a couple mapped out in my head that we're going to talk about. If it's really stupid, we'll just never do this again. But I want to start with Aaron Rodgers. And um, obviously the low-hanging fruit is MVP, but I think that's boring. And it's not even necessarily a hot take at this point. I'm not saying it's likely that he wins MVP, but if, if if you are asking somebody for a hot take and they're like, I think he gets his third MVP, it's like, well, he won two in a row, so it's not that crazy to think, you know, this guy would do it. If you, I mean, if you have to pick one, even though three seems crazy, who are you going to pick? I mean, Josh Allen's a good pick. Pat Mahomes is a decent pick, although we'll see. Obviously, Devontae left and everything, but I don't know. It still seems like it's one of the top options, so it's not really that big of a hot take, but... I started thinking it through, trying to think about what exactly it is that's going to be changing and how that might change things for the positive or for the negative for Aaron Rodgers. And it kind of dawned on me, and I think you can make a case for this going in either direction, but my hot take for Aaron Rodgers is going to be that he's going to break his own completion percentage record, which is what he set last year, uh, well, two years ago in 2020. Aaron Rodgers in 2020 had a completion percentage of 70.2%. He's one of only 19, well, not even 19 people, because half this list is Drew Brees. Only 19 times in NFL history has somebody cracked 70% completion percentage. Six of those 19 are Drew Brees. One is Aaron Rodgers. Now, if you look at his stats, you'll be like, no, that's not true. He's done it twice. But I put a limit on it. You had to throw at least 100 passes, and the other time he did it, he threw like 10 passes. It was way back in like, I don't know, way back in the day. But some other quarterbacks, Troy Aikman did it in 93, uh, Jamie Martin, Matt Ryan, Kirk Cousins, Alex Smith, Deshaun Watson, Derek Carr, Ken Anderson, Colt McCoy, Sam Bradford, Joe Montana, and Taysom Hill. But the reason why I thought that that kind of made sense is sort of twofold. The number one and more obvious reason is because he's going to be operating within structure more. And that was what I think really helped him in 2020. Remember, in 2019, Things weren't really very good. The offense didn't really look that good. The defense didn't really look that good. They kind of just alternated back and forth. You know, one week the offense would play like they looked really competent, but the defense would be terrible and they would find a way to win. And that's kind of how they won 13 games. When one of them was terrible, the other one kind of stepped up. And you'd have, you know, one big game from Aaron Jones, one big game from Lazard, one big game from Rodgers, whatever. And so it was just kind of patchwork. They were able to stitch together 13 wins almost miraculously. But the biggest issue was Aaron Rodgers didn't really seem to buy into the system. He kept seemingly fighting it. In 2020, everything looked smooth. Everything was was just like a smooth operation. Everything kind of came together. You could just feel the scheme coming through as you were watching the game on Sunday. It just looked effortless. It wasn't brute force like we were used to, where it's Aaron Rodgers trying to fit the ball in double coverage to Devontae, who's trying to, you know, break ankles and just, just brute force work your way down the field. It was methodical. And I think with Devontae Adams gone, and I think everyone acknowledges this, they're going to have to really get back to that and really lean on that at a high level. It's the only thing Rodgers has left at this point. Now, maybe he can try to force it to Lazard and all this other stuff, but I think he's going to have to do that. The other thing that got me thinking this is I think there's going to be a lot more high completion percentage, uh, high, high percentage passes, whatever. That's not to say that they're not going to take as many shots, but if you think about it, one of the draws to the completion percentage for uh, Aaron Rodgers is his uh, desire to push the ball down the field a lot, and his number one resource in that regard was MVS, and those two could never get on the same page. Now, occasionally they're going to take shots, and occasionally he does to other guys, like Lazard, and we've already talked about it. His completion percentage to Lazard on deep passes is quite high. In fact, if you just remove MVS from the equation, he does a great job throwing passes down the field. 
he just really struggled with MVS, who is now not on this team. Now, I don't know what the situation is going to be with Christian Watson, and if he has drop issues, that's going to hurt his completion percentage. Not his adjusted completion percentage, but that's not the stat I'm working with. I may have to fudge the numbers. We'll see. But I think what you're really going to be looking at is a lot of Randall Cobb, and Randall Cobb runs within 10 yards. You're going to be looking at a ton of Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. These are really quick, fast passes. you got the wide receiver screens. you got all kinds of stuff like that that I think are going to be much more high percentage. And again, I think when he takes shots, number one, I think it's going to be better because it's not MVS. But I also think he's not just going to be relying on trust quite as much. I trust Devontae to be, you know, once Devontae gets to the left of this guy, I know he's going to be open. I'm just going to launch it with my eyes closed. He's going to throw it if he sees a guy running open down the field, but there's not going to be a whole lot of other times I think he's going to throw it. Now, there are going to be occasions when he's going to expect you to do the right thing, and I'm sure the ball is going to come flat, and he's going to scream at the guy for not running it at the right angle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But again, I'm not looking for 100%. I'm looking for 71-ish percent. 70.2 is what he had, so 70.3 is that or above is what I'm looking for. 74.7, by the way, is the record. I'm not saying hot take he's going to break the record and get 75%, but I will say that he gets um, above 70.2 and has his highest completion percentage. Now, you could possibly deduce from that if he does that again, he's going to win MVP. I mean, he did it in 2020. He was great. He lit everybody up, and he was a clear favorite to win. But I think yards and touchdowns are the primary driver when you're talking about stuff like that. And, you know, high completion passes are shorter passes, so there's less yards. You don't know that we got first downs out of this, and we have no idea if we're getting touchdowns out of this. This may end up being an unsuccessful formula to where Rodgers is able to get halfway down the field, and then things kind of fall flat, or we don't have any idea of what red zone success is going to look like. So I'm not going to take it quite that far, although there is a pretty high probability if things are operating at that high of a level and he's completing that many passes that we're probably getting first downs we're probably getting all the way down the field and we're probably scoring a decent amount of touchdowns i.e yeah probably mvp again moving on to um alan lazard now Uh, i've done a lot of comparisons to him and to robert brooks if you don't know what i'm talking about um i've mentioned how robert brooks in his first three years he had 126 yards and one touchdown 180 yards and no touchdowns, 648 yards and four touchdowns. And then when Sterling Sharp went down, he stepped in, he filled the vacuum. He got 1,497 yards and 13 touchdowns. Now, I don't know that I can give um, Alan Lazard 1,500 yards. That, to me, seems difficult to defend um, just because 1,500 yards is so crazy. But... I'm looking at the 13 touchdowns, and at first when I looked at it, I said, I don't think I can do that, but Alan Lazard, he's had, uh, f- well, his first year was seven yards and no touchdowns, but 477 and three touchdowns, 451, three touchdowns, and then this year, 513 and eight touchdowns. Maybe I can just give him 10, and we'll call it good. But again, when you look at it with the vacuum theory, if we assume Roger stays relatively on course, that he's just not going to completely fall off, what you're looking at with Aaron Rodgers generally is 4,000 yards and 40 touchdowns. Where are those touchdowns going to go? Where are they going to go? How many is Sammy Watkins going to get? He hasn't had more than three touchdowns since, like, since 2017. So let's give him three. We'll be optimistic and say he gets three. Okay, so we got 37 more to distribute. How many is Randall Cobb going to get? Last year he had five, and that was that was on the high side. Let, let's be optimistic and say it goes up because he's got to lean on him a little bit more. All right. Six, seven. I don't know. Give him seven. So that's ten. We have 30 touchdowns to hand out. Christian Watson. I mean, realistically, what do you think Christian Watson's going to get? I don't think it'll be that high. Romeo Dobbs? I don't think it'll be that high. Amari Rogers? I don't think it'll be that high. I mean, you're really looking at... Aaron Jones, you know, through the air, and then, you know, the tight end, Tunyon, Lewis maybe gets one, maybe, DeGuara maybe gets one, but, you know, and it, listen, it's possible one of these, you know, Tunyon has a big year again and has double-digit touchdowns or whatever, and that draws the number, but even if he does, we're at 10. Give 10 to uh, Tunyon. We've got 20 more to distribute. Dylan maybe gets one through the air. If Aaron Jones gets five you know, as far as passes, we've got 15 left. Now, there's no guarantee Aaron Rodgers gets 40 touchdowns. He could get 
30, he could end up with 25, I don't know. But as I said, I don't, I'm not going to strip all that away from him just because Devontae left. And so the point is, and we could do this with yardage too, but I think yardage would be a little bit more complicated because I don't really know. But the point is, I could see a scenario definitely where he at least ties Robert Brooks with 13 touchdowns. Now, could you do this with other people as well? Could you say, well, why don't you, instead of saying Lazard, say Randall Cobb? He relies on him. He likes him as a touchdown target, et cetera, et cetera. Well, because last year Cobb had five and Lazard had eight. That's why. Who was the more reliable target? Who was leaned on more? So my hot take for Alan Lazard is that he has at least 13 touchdowns in the upcoming season. Do one more before the break. Um, I want to look at Randall Cobb. And again, it's just kind of a matter of which statistic kind of seems to make the most sense for what I think is going to be happening for them. So it, it's not really a yardage thing or a touchdown thing. But again, when, I, when you look at how I think the offense is going to be changing, relying on reliable targets like Randall Cobb, shorter passes, it's going to come down a little bit to Randall Cobb's ability at this point. But assuming there's no issues there, I'm kind of looking at targets for Randall Cobb. And I was looking at his history, and, and again, kind of similar to... Uh, at first, when I looked at Robert Brooks, I was like, eh, I don't think I want to do 13 touchdowns. And then the more I looked into it, I thought, eh, maybe maybe that's reasonable. When I looked at Randall Cobb, um, if you look at his targets going backwards, from starting from last year, 39, 48, 83, 61, 92, 84, 129, 127, 47, 104, 31. So there was kind of that pocket there between 2012 and 2015 where he was in the 100 target range, not including 2013 when he got hurt. Since then, he hasn't cracked it, and I thought, yeah, why don't we just say maybe the biggest year since 2017 when he had 92 targets, and we'll call it a call it a day, but um, that was 92 targets that translated to 653 yards and four touchdowns. That's not necessarily a super hot take. I know targets are different than everything else, but just looking at the totality of what that equates to, again, doesn't seem like that big of a hot take. And so I kind of looked at Devontae and said, okay, well, how many targets was he getting? Because if it was like 110, 120, um, I can't just give that to Randall Cobb. But he had 170 last year, basically 10, well, yeah, basically 10 targets a game because it was actually 169, but plus injury. But 150 the year before that, 127, 169 again, 117, 121 in 2016. And that was even prior to him kind of exploding onto the scene. He had 121 targets. And again, a lot of times this gets equated to sort of number one wide receiver. And while Randall's not going to be the number one, so that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Well, he wasn't ever the number one for the Green Bay Packers, but he was still getting 100 plus targets. Plus we're dealing with 17 game season. So really, it's really just seven for him to get back to his 129, which is I think the highest he's ever had. It's seven and a half targets for him to crack 100. It's just under six targets per game and so then finally I went over to PFF and I said okay how many receivers are getting 100 targets in in the NFL well Cooper Cup received 230 targets which is just remarkable Tyree Kill 182 Devontae Adams according to this 177 this is probably postseason which I didn't really specify um, whether I would include post I, I suppose I will just to help me be more correct bottom line though 36 wide receivers um had 100 targets or more. Van Jefferson in L.A., Odell Beckham in L.A. I mean, you had three three wide receivers in L.A. with 100 targets. Tyler Lockett, Robbie Anderson in Carolina. I mean, just names that you wouldn't... I mean, the point is, I'm not looking at this saying, you know, these are elite number one high-volume guys. It's it's like, are you serious? Uh, Michael Pittman in Indian, Indiana, Indianapolis, whatever. Cole Beasley in Buffalo. I know he's doing a good job over there, but he's not the number one guy, not by a mile. Darnell Mooney in Chicago, Hunter Renfro in, in Las Vegas, T. Higgins in Cincinnati. So I, I don't think it's that big of a hurdle, but it's it's a big milestone for Randall Cobb um, to get 100 targets because, again, he hasn't had that since 2015, and, and we know how good Randall Cobb was in 2015. So I'm going to call that a pretty hot take, but also I think it's pretty reasonable to think that he could get that. Again, based on... Um, you know, where else is he going to go? The fact that it's really not that crazy of a number. I'm not even saying 129. I'm just saying he cracks 100. Health is a big factor here, and I think he's been a, a generally pretty reliable um, player. I said generally. And just the fact that it's it's his, his that's his game, you know. 
He's sort of a high-volume slot guy. He's the Cole Beasley. He's kind of the Cooper Cup. I'm not saying talent-wise as good. I'm just saying they're, they're the, the guys that move the chains. They're the guys that just dink and dunk you down the field. And I think there's going to be more of that, and so I think they're going to lean on Randall Cobb a little bit more. And so I'm calling it he's going to get 100-plus targets in 2022. Uh, why don't we take a break here? We'll probably get off a wide receiver and move on just because wide receiver gets to be a little old. We can revisit a couple of the other guys. I'll probably solicit on Patreon too to get some of your hot takes so that we can kind of work those through. Maybe do more of a reaction than just me rattling them off. But as always, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. If you'd like to support the podcast, it would really be greatly appreciated. You can join for as little as $1 per month. Help me out tremendously. So if you like what we're doing over here, um, Please consider that, but otherwise we will take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more know, doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, Quick strategic thinking is crucial, and with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown, and through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. All right, let's take a look at the running backs here, um, because I think this is where things get a lot of fun. You know, when you... Looking at the wide receivers and stuff, let's be completely honest, it's it's reasonable and you can make arguments, even strong arguments for them, but we understand that that's maybe the one part of the team where we're a little concerned. So it's it's fun enough, but it's a lot more fun to look pretty much everywhere else on the team. And I think running back is, is fun because, well, let's, let's talk about it and let's just see. Uh, I, I get more excited talking about it. Let's start with Aaron Jones, um, because I think A.J. Dillon is going to be a little bit more obvious the direction I'm going to head, but, um, and and I think we've probably mentioned this before and and probably have been wrong about it before in terms of how things might change or um, how much more things will go in this direction or that direction, but let's do it anyways because it's fun to think about. I I think the... Generally, the, the Packers love when everybody is an all-purpose back. They like Aaron Jones to be a blocker, to be a receiver, to be a running back. They like A.J. Dillon to be a blocker, to be a receiver, to be a running back, to be a runner, I guess. Running back can be a receiver. If we're going to get all technical about it. But I do think there's going to be some, maybe, I don't, I don't even want to say specialization, but but just allowing things to be what they are. And, and what I think Aaron Jones is, is a really, really scary weapon. And I would borderline, and this is almost blasphemy because he is an incredible running back, but I would borderline say he's a better receiver than a running back. I'm not saying lining up as a wide receiver, route running, all that kind of stuff, but I, I've I've had my jaw drop more times watching him catch passes than anything. I, I don't remember him dropping passes. I'm sure he has. Probably some real easy screen passes. I hit him right in the hands that he dropped, whatever, but 
the the diving catches that he's made, the, the amount of trust he's earned from Aaron Rodgers, throwing these back shoulders, throwing just passes that are too long that he'll go up and get, the hits that he's willing to take. I mean, he he's willing to die for that football. And he's a good runner after the catch. I, I just think they're maybe going to lean on that a little bit, even if it's not more specialty. Maybe maybe both running backs are going to be getting more targets, but considering Aaron Jones is getting the lion's share as it is, if both of them go up as a percentage, Aaron Jones goes up quite a bit more, right? So for example, if we just look at targets, and that's not what we're going to be saying, uh, ultimately that's not what I'm going to be looking at, but let's just look at targets. If you look at regular season and postseason, Aaron Jones had 74 targets. He was fifth in the NFL. A.J. Dillon had 37. He was tied for 39th in the NFL. Again, they want them both to be all-purpose backs, but there's just kind of a general understanding that Aaron Jones is more of that kind of uh, of a guy. And there's nothing wrong with what A.J. A- 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 Dillon has had some incredible catches that shocked me. Not just because he's A.J. Dillon and he's not supposed to be able to catch passes. I'm just saying for anybody. But if you're looking at, I, I don't remember, I think it was 74 compared to 37, if they both get 10% more... Aaron Jones is getting seven and a half more targets, and A.J. Dillon's getting three and a half more targets. It's somewhat exponential, right? So A.J. Dillon goes from 37 to 40. Aaron Jones goes from 74 to 80. It's a pretty big gap there, right? And so the one thing that keeps coming back to me, and I know there's probably better examples, but but you know, obviously one of the uh, most stark examples of this was Pittsburgh back in that 2013 to 2015 area uh, era with Le'Veon Bell. And the reason I love that is because you can call Le'Veon Bell a receiving back if you want, but that's kind of a stupid way to put it because he was probably the best runner in the NFL at that time. Just patient and lethal on the ground, but was also one of the best, <laughs> I mean, just pure receivers in the game too. I mean, just what he does after the catch, his hands, everything, he's just... It's hard to pin down what he was better at and in and, and what ways he was a better weapon. I mean, we, you can look at the stats and say, well, he had more run, yards on the ground than through the air, but talk to a defensive coordinator and say, what, where are you more scared of him, through the air or on the ground? I bet you get a bunch of different answers on that and a whole lot of head scratching and beard rubbing going, ah, pff, I don't know, man. I'm just scared of him. But if you remember, they had uh, generally, and, and, and I, I think the, the biggest disservice to going back to Pittsburgh is the fact that the other running back was always just kind of a eh, factor, and and I don't I don't see that with AJ Dillon, and and that, even that's a little bit unfair because you look at for example when D'Angelo Williams kind of filled that role. Granted, Le'Veon Bell was hurt that that year, but um, 200 attempts, 907 yards, 11 touchdowns is a pretty good season. But anyways, I don't want to minimize that other guy, but the point is you you largely had your bigger, stronger, punishing back, and then you had Le'Veon Bell who was lethal as a runner but also was kind of seen as and i i know aj or uh, jj aj jj hates the term weapon but it's really one of those situations where running back doesn't do it justice and receiving back is even less justice because those are seen as guys that can only be you know usually blockers receivers can't run to save their lives and I just think Aaron Jones has kind of evolved into that kind of a back where it's, it's really hard to just pigeonhole him as a as a running back that also sometimes is a good receiver. I just think he's better than that. And I think he has that Le'Veon Bell potential. Even if even if he's not necessarily peak Le'Veon Bell as a runner or a receiver, he's, he's Le'Veon Bell light. And I think there's an element of if we could unleash that and lean into that a little bit more, I think there's going to be more there for us. I think maybe we're trying to be a little too traditional, a little bit too, you know, Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon need to do the same things at the same time, right? Goal line, Aaron Jones is out there. It's really just whose turn it is. It doesn't matter. We expect you both to do the same thing. And granted, Aaron Jones was great. He showed a lot of power, which is amazing. Sometimes he looks like he's more powerful than A.J. Dillon, and we forget A.J. Dillon's actually faster than Aaron Jones. It's such a weird dynamic between those two, where you try to pigeonhole him, but you can't, and I get it, but maybe we just lean into it a little bit more and accept what they are and, and try to foster what they are. Get get A.J. to be a, 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 a true power back, and I, and I don't mean any of this to be negative, but let's... let's They have superpowers. Let's unleash it. I mean, I, I, I can smack a nail with a wrench. No question about it. I, I nail that nail with a wrench. Those things are heavy and blunt and it'll work, but just, just freaking use the hammer. You know what I mean? It's, it's built for this job. Let's just use it. And again, as I look at these examples, it, it's not a great example just because there's no parallel to the dynamic 
Um, you know, you look at Le'Veon Bell, 261 attempts, D'Angelo Williams, 98. That ain't the case in Green Bay. It's going to be more balanced than that. But but again, that, that kind of works to our benefit. I mean, Le'Veon Bell was a receiver who was getting a ridiculous amount of targets, 94 targets, 75 receptions, 616 yards, two touchdowns through the air, while also getting 261 attempts, 1,268 yards, and seven touchdowns. I mean, they, they were running that guy ragged. No wonder he was injured all the time and really only had those two to three really prominent years with Pittsburgh, right? He, he played well. I think he got into legal trouble. Then he got injured. Then he had a couple good years, and then there was the big contract dispute, and then he went somewhere else, and it just it never really fully materialized, right? He wanted to be a wide receiver or something like that. I, I don't know. But the point is, we don't need Aaron Jones to have 261 attempts and get 1,300 yards on the ground. We have A.J. Dillon, and so we can free him up to be more of what Le'Veon Bell was as a receiver, and that's kind of where I want to go with this. Now, it's it, the, the complication is, again, Aaron Jones is already one of the, the most prominent receivers in the game right now as far as targets. Again, 74 targets, the only ones who had more. DeAndre Swift had 76, Austin Eckler with the Chargers had 88, Leonard Fournette had 92, Najee Harris, Pittsburgh, 96. Again, Pittsburgh, they just don't change. Pittsburgh also, again, if you look at it, one of the reasons they do this, they lean on them, partially because it's just in their DNA, but also because the wide receiver situation over there isn't super great. Also, we're trying to kind of dumb it down for a quarterback that, you know, I mean, you guys saw the, saw him fall over as he tried to throw the ball, right? I mean, it was it was getting ugly. So I'm not saying that's the situation with Rodgers, but there is going to be a similar element of let's take a little bit off the plate of the, the receivers and, and the quarterback from the standpoint of, you know, he doesn't have as much to work with. So again, the complication is how do you look at a guy that's already top of the top of the pecking order of, of the food chain and say he goes up from here? But if we switch off a of PFF and just look at the regular season, because it's unfair to compare postseasons to players that weren't even in there. You know, DeAndre Swift wasn't in the postseason, so that's a little bit unfair. Um, if we look at him from the regular season standpoint, in his career, 52 receptions, 391 yards, 6 touchdowns, 47, 355, and 2, 49, 474, and 3, 26, 206, and 1, and then in his first year, he had uh, 9 receptions, no touch, 22 yards, no touchdowns. So he's hovering in the 40 to 50, 300 to 400, and, you know, as far as receiving touchdowns, he had 6 last year, but that was a big outlier. Again, big outlier, but also kind of moving in that direction. It was the first time he cracked 50 receptions, right? From a yardage standpoint, it was less, but also he went from three, which was his most in 2019, to six. Coincidentally, in the same year that A.J. Dillon kind of takes a more prominent role as, you know, on this offense. I'm just saying, maybe take another step in that direction. And so the question is, what is specifically the hot take? Well, I looked over at Le'Veon Bell because, again, I want to kind of get an idea of what something truly remarkable would be, right? If you look at PFF for 2021, um, you know, this is regular season and postseason. Let me just get regular season. Let me get postseason out of here. Aaron Jones drops to sixth, but you got 74, 70, 69, 62, 54, 52, and then Aaron Jones tied him with uh, Cordero Patterson at 52 receptions in the regular season. That's a lot, but for perspective, again, uh, Najee Harris was at 74, and if you look back at Le'Veon Bell in his heyday, back when he was just absolutely crushing it, um, you're talking 2014, 105 targets, 83 receptions. Uh, he was injured the next year, and then he comes back. He only played, and, and th in 2016, this is in 12 games. He was injured again. He was injured pretty much every year, but he only played 12 games. In those 12 games, he still had 94 targets, 75 receptions. He would have been, I think, more than anybody this entire year, only playing 12 games, 616 yards and two touchdowns. And then the next year with Pittsburgh, his last year with Pittsburgh, um, he played 15 games, which again, too shy of what we hope Aaron Jones will play this year, 106 targets, 85 receptions, 655 yards, two touchdowns. Just through the air, right? And, and he led the league in in um, rushing attempts, 321 rushing attempts on the ground in Pittsburgh in 2017 in 15 games. Again, Aaron Jones doesn't have to do that. And so when you factor in the lesser reliance on Devontae Adams and wide receivers as a whole, there's no real 
true, genuine, elite tight end that you're leaning on. Again, I think Tunyon will probably take a step. I think you're going to have other guys like Lazard who are going to get more targets and, and, and Randall Cobb and whatnot. But a portion of that share goes to Aaron Jones, who's already quite high. And what does that translate to? I think he leads the league in receptions. I don't know if that's 70, 75, 80, but I think as a running back, he will lead the league in receptions. And honestly, the the low-hanging fruit here for Aaron Jones is, even if he doesn't lead the league in receptions, probably an easier, uh, lesser hot take, but easier to to get correct would be receiving touchdowns, because this guy is a touchdown hawk. I mean, he he has just got a sense about him. We've seen what he's done on the ground as a receiver, but he also was number two in receiving touchdowns with six. This guy just has an ability about him to, I mean, we've already said not a lot of big plays from the Green Bay Packers running backs. But when Aaron Jones has a big play, it seems like 75% of the time it's going to be a touchdown. Like it just, there's something about that guy. He's just got a nose for the end zone. So that would be another kind of low hanging fruit one that he, he leads the running backs in receiving touchdowns. But I'm just going to stick with, with leading the league in receptions for a running back. Again, those targets got to go somewhere, and and I think a big portion goes to Randall Cobb. Obviously, a lot goes to Lazard. You got a pile going to Tunyon, and everybody else that gets distributed. But um, outside of, I mean, you could even argue that Aaron Jones has has probably the biggest boost, maybe as a percentage, not not as total numbers, but as a percentage, Aaron Jones probably gets the biggest boost in receptions, just because, I mean, the team loves it. Aaron Jones is so reliable. Rodgers loves Aaron Jones. He's, he's such a great matchup weapon. It just makes a ton of sense. And, and again, he doesn't have that far to go. He was, you know, what? He tied for sixth in the regular season. So I'm still calling it a hot take, but in reality, it's, you know, wouldn't be that shocking. All right, finally, let's take a look at Mr. A.J. Dillon. And I, I think we kind of know what direction we're going here. I, I think in order to free up Aaron Jones, who's still going to get a ton of carries and a ton of yards and a ton of opportunities on the ground, um, I think the lion's share goes to A.J. Dillon. And I think what we've been wanting for a long time, and maybe we're stupid in wanting this, but kind of wanting that back that's going to get those 20 carries. You know, a guy that can handle that kind of punishment. You know, we, we, we understand you can't give it to Aaron Jones as much as we want to. You know, we would love for him to get 20, 25, 30 carries because the guy's so good. But you understand he's not built that way, and you, you, you need that longevity. You want him, you know, not just in the postseason, but you want him next year and the year after, and hopefully for a very long time. I don't know where we're at with that today, but the point is, I get it. But we got a guy now that can handle a little bit more punishment. And I'm not saying we need to run this guy into the ground. I'd love to have him for a long time as well, but he's built for it. He can handle 17, 18, 19, 20, 25, you know, on occasion, 20 plus, maybe 30 on 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 a wild, crazy day. And we've already seen A.J. Dillon take the mantle from Aaron Jones as the primary running back, which is which is a great step in the right direction. In fact, he ranked 20th in 17 games with 187 attempts. But I'm not just looking at attempts for A.J. Dillon because I, I think there's a compounding effect that's going to take place here. Do I think A.J. Dillon's attempts go up? Yes, I do. He's already received more carries than Aaron Jones, but there still seemed to be a hesitance um, to give him the ball, especially early on in, in his second year. If you look at the first few weeks, um, four attempts, five attempts, six attempts, then 15, back to eight, 11, back to three, 16, back to eight. And then it kind of got to be a little bit more, 21, 11, 20, 15, 7, 9, 14. So they started to lean on him more toward the end of the season. The other really promising thing is his grades went up as the season went on. His first three weeks were some of his worst three weeks. In fact, the only game, um, if you exclude week seven, where he had a 26 overall grade, it was really bad. Um, he had two fumbles, so he didn't really get any opportunity. So it was a really flukish, weird thing. His only two fumbles of the season were both in that game. But aside from um, that game, his worst three games were the first three games, 59, 54, 64. After that, and excluding the Week 7 Washington game, it was 83, 70, 75, 80, 70, 83, 70, 77, 75, 65, 69, 73, 68. I mean, he hovered in that 70 to 80 every single week with with incredible consistency, which is incredibly important, not only just being a marker of a good football player, but in terms of trust. Can we rely on you week in and week out to be a guy that can, you know, get the ball regularly? So 
if he just picks up where they left off, starting in like week 10, and just carry that through, where it was 22, 13, 22, 18, 8, 11, 14, 15 snaps, and, and you know roughly the same amount of attempts, I ran, read the wrong column, it's fine, snaps are fine, and there weren't really a lot of dips aside from against Baltimore, primarily in that game just because of the flow of the game more than anything else, just based on that, he's going to get more attempts, and it's going to go up. But I also think we're going to maybe give him more right? So the, the, there's two factors to the more. One is more overall period. Two is the fact that last year was deflated because the first half of the season, they were still kind of ramping up and weren't really trusting him a ton. So now he's going to get a full season of that trust between 10 and 20 carries. But then also instead of from 10 to 20, maybe, you know, 12-ish to 22-ish. So all that combines for more attempts for A.J. Dillon. More attempts means naturally more yards. It doesn't have to be, but generally, unless there's a massive decline in his ability to run. So that's the first factor. He's going to get more attempts. Secondly, and again, this is for a couple different reasons, I think his yards per attempt goes up. He had 4.3 last year. It's a fine number. It's not super elite. It's decent, right? It's not Aaron Jones in his heyday getting 5.5 yards per attempt every single week. But I think there's a couple factors here. Number one, the offensive line, I think, improves. David Bakhtiari coming back, presuming that's fine, is a big one. Um, he was never considered a run blocker previously, but once Matt LaFleur came in, they emphasized it. He stepped up and was a fantastic run blocker. Number two, cohesion along the offensive line. And I don't know exactly what that offensive line is going to look like, but unless we have constant devastation along the offensive line like we had last year where there was a constant shuffling and I'm sure there's going to be some injuries here and there but to the point where you just never had the same offensive line from week to week I don't see that happening which means I think there will be more cohesion plus you've got guys that are kind of just getting more familiar John Runyon has another year if Royce stays there another year third factor among the offensive line I think we're on three I'm not sure where we're at at this point I'm just kind of running with it improvement number you know the (laughs) three a Improvement from year to year. John Runyon, Royce Newman, et cetera, et cetera. Elton Jenkins. Josh Myers is a big one, right? Again, he was not very good last year, but his ceiling is very high. The expectation for him is a pretty big jump in year two, plus just playing the whole year, uh, ideally. But beyond that, potential improvement. Maybe Sean Ryan takes a job. Maybe Zach Tom takes a job. So the offensive line improves as people return from injury, potentially improves as better players take offensive line spots, improves because guys are going into another year, right? Josh Myers has more experience. John Runyon's going to have more experience. Royce Newman's going to have more experience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and improves because of cohesion. The offensive line will block better in the run game, almost guaranteed. It's it's not guaranteed, but almost guaranteed. I mean, you, you, the, the, the odds are so stacked in that direction, it's insane. So A.J. Dillon will get more carries. He'll be running behind a much improved offensive line. And then the third overarching thing here is that the number one thing they've been working on is trying to get more explosive plays out of A.J. Dillon, which is why the averages are so low for him. It's not because he's not a good runner from from down to down. It's because a lot of these other guys who have higher yards per attempt, including guys like Aaron Jones, isn't because he's on average going to get five yards. I mean, if if you bet he's going to get five yards on this play, you're probably wrong and it's probably going to be lower because on a on a general play to play basis, he's getting two, three yards. But it's because of that one 25 yard run that averaged it out to, you know, eight yards per carry in that game, which over the course of the season, with those twos and threes and fours mixed in, averaged out to 5.5. Dylan did not have a lot of big breakaway runs. He has the ability. He certainly has the speed. He's improving with his vision. A lot of times it's just breaking open field tackles, you know, beating that one guy. And if they emphasize that and they really make that a key and he just gets a handful of them, gets, you know, one every other game. You know, if you look at his longest carries um, on a game-to-game basis, he had very few. I mean, how many games did he have? 15 plus carries? Four. Four carries where he had at least 15 yards. That's it. How many did he have? 10 plus? Only nine. Longest run on a week-to-week basis, 9, 9, 8, 6, 11, 8, 11, 11, 15, 12, 3, 36, 17, 25, 6, 8, 6. He's got the ability. And again, it's a big emphasis. And so recapping all three, number one, he's going to get more carries. 
Number two, he's going to be running behind a better offensive line. Number three, he's going to have more big explosive runs. What does all of that combine into? A lot more yards. A lot more yards. He had 803 last year. Let's just take the first one, 4.3 yards per attempt. Let's just assume it stays the same. If he goes from 187 attempts to, let's say, 210 attempts, that already puts him up to 903. But what if with the improved offensive line and the more explosive plays, we're looking at five yards per carry? Now you crack 1,000 yards. But here's the thing. We're still playing with pretty low numbers, right? I, I, I gave him barely 200 yards. There were 17, 18 uh, running backs that had that many. In fact, A.J. Dillon almost had that money to begin with. And so you look at some of these other running backs, and, and a lot of them are kind of built like he is. You got Damian Harris, 202. Melvin Gordon's a big dude, 203. Sony Michelle, 208. Derrick Henry, 220. David Montgomery in Chicago, 225. Nick Chubb, 228. Ezekiel Elliott, 237. Kamara had 240. Dalvin Cook, 250. Joe Mixon, 292, Najee Harris, 307, Jonathan Taylor, 332. Jonathan Taylor had 332 attempts, 1,800 yards, 5.5 yards per attempt. Here's the thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying he's as good as Jonathan Taylor, but remember, two years ago, when they were rookies, he did have a higher grade than Jonathan Taylor, and everybody freaked out about that. And even today, he's not that far behind Jonathan Taylor in terms of grades when you look at just how good they are, which is important. Because what we know is, it, that's, that's the one nice thing about the grades, is it tells you they're about equal in terms of talent. Jonathan Taylor has more opportunities. He has a better offensive line. He has way more opportunities. And so you get the better yards per attempt. You get the more attempts. You get the more yards. 1,800 yards, 18 touchdowns. That's how you get that. And so I, I really want to push this number up, and I'm, I'm kind of having a hard time as far as the math is concerned, getting it super, super high. I'm trying as hard as I can to get it to 1,300. <laughs> I really am, but um, outside of Jonathan Taylor, nobody cracked that. Nick Chubb had 1,258, Joe Mixon 1,205, Najee Harris 1,200. And so I think what I'm going to say is A.J. Dillon cracks 1,200 rushing yards. And that's with Aaron Jones on the team. That's with the team that still loves to throw the ball and all that stuff. That, I mean, it, it's a lot. It's hard to get there. If he has 250 attempts, which is what Dalvin Cook had last year, and he averages five yards per attempt, that's 1,250 yards. That's It's hard to push that much higher. It's, it's possible the yards per attempt is higher. It's possible the carries are higher, but I think both of those are kind of pushing it. So the easier bar to hit, I mean, it, it's still kind of a hot take, and if you wanted to go this route, you could. He cracks 1,000 yards. That'll give you a lot more leeway, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay put here. And I honestly think the, the, the biggest thing kind of holding this back is Aaron Jones. Because I, I think the Packers are still going to want to try to split the carries a little close to even. But like with all these, assuming that there aren't uh, injuries and everything else, I'm leaving it at that. A.J. Dillon, 1,200 yards. It's going to recap him, but I don't know if I remember them all. But anyways, that's what it is. And, and, and again, I, I love thinking about it because it's not just pie-in-the-sky nonsense. It's really not. I mean, it's, you, you can see the path. It's, it's math. You know what I mean? It's... Again, unfortunately, the math kind of worked against me in terms of I want to call it 1,300, but I just I can't quite get it there. I mean, the, the biggest way that that happens is those explosive runs. I mean, if, if he can get up to 5.5 yards per attempt, you still need to have the attempts, but now it's suddenly doable. But having both, you know, 250 attempts and 5.5 yards per attempt, you know, now you're talking 1,300 yards, but are you going to have both? That's tough. But anyways, I, I, I don't know. I enjoyed it. We'll probably do more of these. I don't, I don't think I'm going to try to do um, entire episodes because it'll probably get exhausting, but maybe maybe individual segments for players we'll kind of run through since it's summer. The hot takes of summer, right? <laughs> we'll kind of keep this thing going. Hopefully we won't have to because there's going to be some big news out there one of these days, but uh, until that happens, we'll, we'll kind of keep this running. Again, jump in on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash back underscore daddy for as little as a dollar a month, and I will uh, you'll be able to jump in and give your takes. I'm going to do that. Right now, as I upload, waiting for this to upload, I will shoot that question over to you. And again, it's going to be, um, Patreon's going to be even more important these days because uh, with me still doing the social media thing, which again, I would encourage you to try it. It's been wonderful. Occasionally, I'll get like a glimpse. I'll just see a news article of like, you know, people in each other's faces arguing at protests, and it just sends a chill down my spine like, oh, I forgot about that, how horrible that is. And I click off of it right away. You just forget that that stuff happens, man. It's been nice. But anyways, Patreon is going to be the place where you can you can 
get in touch with me, you can send me, I'm bad at checking messages, but I've got nowhere else to look these days. So you can send me messages on Patreon and I will uh, check it. And otherwise you can participate in the polls and uh, the questions and all that kind of stuff. It'll be fun. But otherwise you guys have yourselves a fantastic holiday. Sorry, it was a little bit late getting out. I hope you can still enjoy it. Listen to it while you're out grilling up some burgers or some ribs or something. And uh, I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.